Hello and welcome to Correspondence, the best from France 24's teams around the world. In this edition, we'll be heading to Germany in a debate over which kinds of masks best stop the spread of COVID-19. We'll be taking you to Nairobi to meet the Kenyan grandmothers turning to self-defense. We'll be in the DRC for a glimpse at a unique women-only sport. Well, we start in Egypt, where it's been 10 years now since the uprising which ousted Hosni Mubarak. Bread, freedom and social justice, that was the rallying cry of protesters who thronged Cairo's Tahrir Square. But a decade on, one in three people live under the poverty line and rights groups have repeatedly sounded the alarm bell over conditions under President Sisi's government. This from Edouard Dropsy, Claire Willio and Matthew Thompson. Getting ready to move out. Hossam Bagat, the acting head of this human rights organisation, is making sure everything is in order. Because we had to move before the end of January and so... Uh... If the landlord has asked his tenants to leave, it's because last November three members of their staff were imprisoned by the authorities for belonging to a terrorist group. Following an international outcry, they were released after just three weeks a grotesque situation in which freedoms are threatened in the name of the fight against terrorism. Well, terrorism became a meaningless word. Um, uh, when uh, Sisi was elected president in 2014, he changed the terrorism law and basically made everything terrorism. So, and the problem is the s prosecution authorities, the judiciary, be uh, started supporting this, became part of this machine. No one is safe. And I think every Egyptian uh, understands this now. In September 2019, at least 4,000 people were arbitrarily detained. This young Egyptian was arrested whilst filming protests with his mobile phone and was jailed for 12 days. Today, Egypt has around 60,000 political prisoners, although, according to human rights groups, this figure is an underestimate. Next to Germany, where struggling with a stubborn second wave, authorities have extended coronavirus restrictions into the middle of February. What's more, homemade face coverings are out on public transport and in shops. People now have to wear surgical masks or so-called FFP2 ones, normally reserved for medical professionals. This from Anne Maillet, Willy Mahler and Nick Spicer. They call it the duck's beak here. In Germany, the FFP2 mask that powerfully filters the air is everywhere. Ich das eigentlich schon seit Ende letzten Jahres, als meine Mutter da war, die ist alt. Das ist eine Cost-Benefit-Frage. Letztendlich geht es um Gesundheit. Ja. Ich denke, sie schützt besser als Stoff und dann fühle ich mich sicherer. Since the 25th of January, wearing the FFP2 mask, or at least a surgical mask, has been obligatory in stores still open and in public transport. Matei and Robert Erdich saw an opportunity in the COVID crisis. They began producing their made in Germany masks in November. 30 employees produce two and a half million masks a month here, a promising market for the young entrepreneurs who used to deal in gemstones before. We see that the people have a certain Alltag with the mask. In the industry, in the production, wollen die Leute ihre Mitarbeiter schützen. Wir denken in den öffentlichen Gebäuden, in Krankenhäusern, so wie Alters, Altersheime, wird das ein Standard sein. The cloth mask that people have worn since April should fall out of use. And with good cause, says this epidemiologist, new mutant strains of the virus require tougher precautions. Also eine richtig gute Filterwirkung so in beide Richtungen, das hat eine FFP2-Maske. Die Frage ist nur, schaffen wir es, dass wir die auch tatsächlich kostengünstig für alle zur Verfügung stellen und dass sie eben auch vorhanden ist, dass wir das so machen. A regular surgical mask like this costs around 50 Euro cents, but an FFP2 mask like this goes for between 4 and 8 Euros. And that's a big difference if you're living on a tight budget. A difference the government shows no sign of being willing to make up. What's more, pharmacies in many places are already out of stock. 
We're next to Kenya, where one report says that women aged over 60 are the victims of one in five cases of sexual violence. Our correspondents, Bastien Ronoui and Elodie Cousin, headed to the Nairobi district of Korogocho, where older women are fighting back. In front of a crowd of elderly spectators, Jane is simulating an assault. No! 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 She's teaching the club self-defense. If someone comes to assault you, to attack you, they could also want to rape you. You must not stay silent. I myself was a victim of rape. I was assaulted in 2007. Six months later, a woman offered me self-defense lessons. At that time, several women spoke up and told me that they had experienced the same thing. The group was formed from these meetings. In the slum of Korogocho, attacks are frequent and no one is safe. Every month, the self-defense course welcomes students aged 75 to 100 in a room usually used to dry clothes. Regardless of their fitness levels, the ladies take part in some physical activity. They learn how to summon the courage to call for help in the event of assault, often committed by much younger men. Young men go after older women because they think they won't have sexually transmitted infections. That's why they wait around for us in the slum, to attack us. This subject is extremely taboo. Getting together allows the women to talk about it. Njoki has been living alone since her husband died two years ago. This makes her vulnerable. I thank God. Thanks to him, I'm well. And I was able to learn a lot of things. In particular, how to protect myself. After class, Njoki's walk home is just a few meters. But at night, it is easy for an intruder to pass through the thin metal door. That's what happened to her a few weeks ago. But she managed to scare the attacker away. The other women and children should learn what we've been taught so that they can protect themselves as well. She says the number of violent incidents has decreased in Korogocho thanks to the self-defense courses. She hopes that similar projects will now spread across Kenya. Finally, to the Democratic Republic of Congo and a heady mix of sport and music. Practiced solely by women, and Zongo was recently recognized as an official discipline. We can get a taste of it now with Clement Bonnero and Julia Dubois. Oh, Mark. It may have originated in playgrounds, but make no mistake, Zango is anything but chance play. On either side of the pitch, two teams vie for victory. Mokolo Ibende, steel legs in Lingala, and Kuya, which means come in Swahili. One by one, players jump and clap their hands to the rhythm of traditional songs while throwing their legs into the air as quickly as possible. <laughs> Zango, which means footwork in Lingala, is played in two halves of 25 minutes each. The team that scores the most points wins the game. It's an all-female sport that appeals to players of all ages and backgrounds. Edith Kongolo set up the Steel Legs team with women from her neighborhood. Now she's passing on her passion to her daughters. You will fight your mother. Ah, on va voir. Si vous voulez me battre, vous devez jouer le même pied. Zango is recognized as an official sport in DR Congo and Congo Brazzaville, with national federations active in both countries. Mon rêve c'est que on puisse vraiment le 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 rendre jusqu'au niveau olympique que tout le monde Découvre qu'est-ce que c'est que le Nzango. 
While it remains little known internationally, Zango is proving increasingly popular on the continent. It's also played in Cameroon, Gabon and the Central African Republic. That's it for this edition. Thanks for watching and thanks to Georges Yazbek for the camera work. Producing was Agnès Lecossec. Going to leave you now with some images from Siberia where even by local standards it's been a chilly winter. Temperatures dropping to minus 50 degrees Celsius. Tough conditions but an opportunity for photographers. France 24 parce que en tant qu'étudiante en sciences politiques, ça me permet de rester à jour sur les informations dans le monde, sur les conflits, les débats politiques, tout ça. Le contraste entre France 24 et les canaux de télé dans le milieu le plus diverse et dans le regard le plus proche de la vie quotidienne. J'aime leur couverture, surtout avec les news et les politiques, mais aussi j'aime leur aspect culturel parce que ça, moi, en tant que Kenyan. I get to learn a lot about Francophone, Africa Francophone in general, whether it's in Europe or here, just from France 24. France 24 m'aide à voir une perspective plus complète du monde et à comprendre différentes langues et différentes cultures. France 24, with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité. Arctic is going to be exploited and the scale of this exploitation will only grow. We have a beautiful planet, we need to protect it, and we can use space exploration to better understand it. Now we've, we've moved from, is that real, to what do we do about it? Join us on Down to Earth, where we explore the incredibly complex relationship between humans and our planet. We're here to ask the tough questions and find answers that may just surprise you. Down to Earth, on France 24 and france24.com. You might watch France 24 in English, but don't forget, France 24 is also broadcast in French, Arabic, and Spanish. Available on cable and satellite systems and online media in France and around the world.